But unfortunately, it'll never happen. Front! Bunches! And bunches! And it's over! I think it's gonna be over. say there seems an element of genuine hate between these two Ambrose. For sure. I don't hate the man. Just imagine if you bought a ticket. Stop it, Frank. You can stop it any time. Castillo's in trouble. Leak steps in and the fight is over. Oh! Welcome back, fight fans, to another episode of BTR Boxing Podcast, Legendary Nights. I'm your host, John Basto, joined as always by Johnston Brown for this patron commissioned Legendary Nights. One of our patrons, Dan Loser, big shout out to you, Dan. You had the option to commission an episode and you've chosen the Legendary Nights series to do it on. And this episode, Fight Fans, is all about the tale of Joe Calzaghe and Mikhail Kessler from 2007. And what a wonderful fight it is to have selected, Dan. We're really happy to be doing this fight because it was a brilliant fight and we'll of course get into it all as we go throughout the course of the story but I'm I'm happy to be doing something a little bit against the grain it's not as story filled as maybe some of the the last few episodes of the Legendary Night series but it is still a brilliant fight to be covering it goes back to the original premise of what Legendary Nights is all about just a good old-fashioned fight a good old-fashioned build-up and a great slugfest and, and a wonderful night of boxing Johnston I'm happy to be doing this one what about you? Yes, uh, great pick, Dan Luzzi. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, a great one to commission. And, and you know what? As you say, it is just an old-fashioned fight. You know, no no bollocks involved. It is literally a straight-up two fellas going to go in a ring and they're going to have a go at each other. And, and not only is it great, it's not, not necessarily just a slugfest. You know, great technical ability. Two guys at the top of their game in the super middleweight division colliding. You c- it's a legendary night by itself, just that fight. So anything that surrounded it didn't necessarily need I mean, it's just a fight, as you say. It is just a great fight. And that is that is the be-all and end-all of Legendary Night. So, great pick, Dan. Something we haven't done for a while with the episodes. We used to do it on a few of our episodes in the early premise of the series. And it was setting the scene of what year it was when this fight took place. Now, before we get on their collision course to how the fight come about and how it took place, the fight itself took place in 2007. Now, I just wanted to sort of set the scene and set the context of events that occurred in that particular year. So I'm going to run through a little list of them first and just talk about some of these particular events and our memories of them, of course, and and how good of a year it was for, for certain things happening. So let's go with the first thing, the United States president. Who was he at the time? Well, it was George W. Bush. Only for another year, of course. The prime minister, oh God, was Tony Blair, and then it was Gordon Brown, and in the charts, Beyonce, she was topping the billboard with Irreplaceable. The number one movie of the year was Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. And for any of you TV junkies, The Sopranos' final episode. One of the greatest shows ever made, The Sopranos' final episode aired in 2007. The birth of smartphone technology. The very first iPhone was invented in 2007. In the rugby, it was the World Cup. And South Africa beat England in the final to win. For you Americans and you Canadians who, who love your different sports... The Anaheim Ducks won the Stanley Cup. The San Antonio Spurs won the NBA Finals. The Indianapolis Colts beat the Chicago Bears to win the Super Bowl. And for the sports entertainment fans, The Undertaker, he won the Royal Rumble that year for the first time in his career. The fastest man on earth at that point wasn't Usain Bolt, it was actually Tyson Gay. And in football or in soccer, Manchester United, well, they won the Premier League that particular year. Chelsea, they won the FA Cup at the first final at the new Wembley Stadium. And AC Milan beat Liverpool to win the Champions League. Kaká was voted the best footballer in the world. And for us, a little personal one for us, you being a Millwall fan and me being an Oldham Athletic fan, well, wasn't a great time for me. Millwall beat Oldham 2-1 away and then 1-0 at home. But Oldham actually finished 6th that year and Millwall finished 10th in League One. Unfortunately, as an Oldham fan, I watched Blackpool defeat us in the promotional playoffs and we never got promoted in fact we actually got relegated and now we're stuck in even lower league than what we were before but more importantly then Johnston the boxing what was going on in 2007 at that time well Vladimir Klitschko he was the number one heavyweight and Johnston why don't you take us through that top 10 in 2007 yeah just just to round it off a great year in uh, 
2007 there, to be fair. Some great little moments that I remember keenly and that Undertaker winning the first World Rumble. I remember watching that uh, as a good one. Um, so, yeah, the, the pound for pound top 10 by the ring. The number one, of course, was Floyd Mayweather Jr. And number two was Manny Pacquiao. Number three, one Manuel Marquez. Number four, Bernard Hopkins. Five, Carol Zaghi. Six, Israel Vasquez. Seven, Miguel Cotto. Eight, Ricky Hatton. Nine, Ronald Winky Wright. And at 10 was Rafael Marquez. So both Marquez brothers in the top 10 of the pound for pound list. So I think that sets the scene quite nicely. I'm sure if you're listening, someone will remember something one of those events if not all of them and some will have fond memories and some will have not so fond but <laughs> it just sets a, a scene of what it was like in, in 2007 and to think that the, the iPhone was invented in this year I know and how many of us now can actually go about our iPhone it's, it's, it's incredible isn't it it is so with Legendary Nights fans if you've not heard it before what we tend to do in the episodes is we tend to give you a bit of a collision course of how these two fighters got in the ring the lead up to it the journeys to get to this particular fight and we always go back and take it as far back as we possibly can without going through a whole career profile and we're going to start with Mikhail Kessler now talking about his early career because we've never done anything on him before we decided to put a little bit more in for Kessler now he was crowned the European champion the Danish champion five times and the Nordic champion as a youth and he lost just three of his 47 bouts as an amateur he made his professional debut on March the 20th, 1998 against the 34-year-old Kelly Mays, who was 6-0 and with 5 KOs, a winning record. Not a bad way to start your professional debut. He was from Louisville, and that fight took place in Aarhus, Denmark, when Kessler was just 19 years of age. Now, under the guidance of Ricard Olsen, Kessler originally campaigned as a light middleweight and then a middleweight for the first 17 fights of his career. Now, he fought all but one of those fights in Denmark. The single bout he did have overseas at the time came against the Puerto Rican Israel Ponce at the Mandalay Bay Event Centre in Las Vegas. Kessler and his team arrived in Vegas the day before his 21st birthday and when he tried to have a flutter in the casino he was actually refused and told to come back tomorrow. <laughs> now the fight was a straightforward second round knockout and the last time he would fight on foreign soil for five years. His last fight in the middleweight division was a couple of victories later which ended with another second round knockout this time against american kevin hall at the kb hallen in copenhagen on april the 28th in 2000 so uh jumping on to kawasaki a little intro there to to Kessa, a very brief one from his youth all the way up until this date uh, in 2000 and, and august 12th 2000 at the wembley conference center in london uh, a certain Joe Calzaghi defended the WBO super middleweight title that he had won off, of course, Mr. Chris Eubank Sr. back in 1997. And that fight was against Omar Shiko, who was at 20 and 1. Now, the American was full of trash talk before the fight. And during the uh, introductions, you can actually see him shouting his mouth off at Calzaghi and then shoving him as he gave their final instructions. Uh, I did have a quick watch back on this. It's quite a funny fight. Uh, Sheikha, well, he was full of confidence going into the fight, especially after defeating a young, I say young, yeah, 2000, Glenn Johnson, in his last outing. Both were undefeated, and they produced a high, intense affair, uh, but it was Kalzaghi that came out on top with a fifth round stoppage. Uh, it was fun while it lasted, although the referee did stop it a little bit prematurely. It was another impressive performance from the Welsh Wizard uh, because, of course, uh, the jury was still out with his critics claiming that he still lacked that big marquee name. Kalzaghi moved to 13-0 after this against Richie Woodall, 26-2. Richie Woodall obviously been doing the Olympics for us recently and he was the former WBC Super Middleweight Champion after beating Fulanli Malenga. Uh, Joe and Richie Woodall, they were good friends it was hard for them both to fight against each other you know, with, with a friendship. Uh, but, you know, having to beat two lumps out of each other, they understood the nature of the business. This is what, it is, this is what they're in the business for. And after putting down Woodall in the ninth, Kalzaghi punished the Baggies hero, West Brom fan, with blistering hand speed, showing great ability to mix it up to the head and body in what was a top, top, top class finish from Kalzaghi at Sheffield Arena. And to jump on a little bit further, four months later, it was back to Cardiff for a routine win over another undefeated fighter with Mario Viet 
By this point, Mikel Kessler was now a fully-fledged super middleweight with 22 fights and zero defeats, but he was still only fighting six rounders, surprisingly, after 22 fights. The biggest night of his professional career came at the parking in Copenhagen on October the 13th, 2001, against the Mexican David Mendez. He won a comfortable six-round decision, winning every round. Now, the fight itself is one that Kessler has long forgotten, but the night was something that he will savour forever. He shared the card, which was broadcast live on Sky Sports and Showtime, with Ray Mercer, Mike Tyson, and the Danish heavyweight legend Brian Nielsen, who had to retire in his corner against Mike Tyson after six rounds. The other guy on the card was a certain Joe Calzaghe, who stopped Will McIntyre, who was 29-2. and two. He dropped the American in the third round with a ferocious left uppercut. The challenger managed to beat the count, but Calzaghe floored him again at the start of the fourth round, and the referee called halt to proceedings. Now, it was the Welshman's first fight on foreign soil, making his eighth defence of the WBO super middleweight title. And Kessler, he remembers telling his team, I want to fight that guy one day, and I'll beat him. Although Carl Zaghi did admit to watching Kessler and being impressed, he later admitted, one day I think I'm going to be fighting this guy. He was more interested in promoting himself in New York. He overcome his fear of flying and travelled across the pond and worked with Showtime for a bit of a publicity and exposure in America. Following his brief trip to the States, Calzaghe took on the tough American Charles Brewer, who was 37-8 and in his 10th defence of the WBO title. It was a brilliant fight that was action-packed throughout, and Calzaghe showed his amazing hand speed, high intensity and solid chin in one of the most entertaining fights of his career. Next was a unanimous decision against Miguel Angel Jimenez, who was 21-2 at the Cardiff Castle in Wales. It was a one-sided performance that was more remembered due to the stunning backdrop of the Cardiff Castle. Enzo Macronelli, Gavin Rees, Alex Arthur and Jeff Lacey all featured on this card on the 17th of August 2002. So jumping on to Kessler and, and Kessler, well, he continued his winning streak with impressive knockouts over six of his next seven opponents and improving his career record to 29-0 with 22 KOs. Impressive and then on November 29, 2002, out of Falconer Centret Fredericksburg in Denmark, he fought the former WBC super middleweight champion, Dingan Fiabella, who was 49 and 2 in his first 12 rounder. Incredible. First 12 rounder in his, uh, what, 29 fights. In, crazy. Kessa remembers being given only two weeks' notice, but he still went on to win with a complete shutout, uh, with all three judges scoring the same, 120 to 108. And and that victory, well, that secured him the less less prestigious uh, at the time, anyway, the, still now today. I mean, like, <laughs> what's happened to the IBA? Uh, the IBA super middleweight title, which had been vacated by uh, Reginald Andrade. Now, the following month, in front of a sellout crowd of 10,000 in Newcastle, we jump back to Joe Calzaghe and, and he stopped Toka Pudwill between 39 and 4 in two rounds. Now, Calzaghe was due to actually take on the veteran American Thomas Tate, but the fight fell through, so Pudwill stepped in. Now, the Welshman, well, he was in dominant mode. And from that moment, the fight began uh, with his American opponent hitting the canvas twice in the opening round before being saved from further punishment right on the bell and then well, moments later in the second round, Pudwell was just well out of his depth here with his right eye virtually closed. He fell onto his knees and the referee ended the fight. Calzaghe, who recorded his 27th career knockout in front of the uh, Geordie legend Alan Shearer, said after the bout, I love knocking people out. If I'm extra critical of myself, I rushed at him too much in the first round. I'm one of the best path fighters in the world. I want to be remembered as one of the best British boxers ever. I need to move up a level and I'm ready to fight Bernard Hopkins. That won't be the first time we call out Hopkins. And it was a great night uh, of boxing in Newcastle with the highly charged crowd cheering on, obviously, Ricky Hatton and Alex Arthur again. They just seem to always uh, end up on the same card and they all featured on that same bill. Yeah, because it was because he was obviously all with Frank Warren at the time when Frank yeah. Warren actually had a really, really good stable with the likes of Alex Arthur, Ricky Hatton, Joe Calzaghe being obviously their, their cash cows at the time. Now back to Kessler and he wasn't content with minimal success. So 
He gave up that lesser regarded IBA belt and decided to fight for the WBC international title on the 11th of April 2003 against Craig Cummings who was 51-4-1 winning by a knockout in the third round. He then made three successful defences of that title against a couple of notable opponents in Henry Porras and Julio Cesar Green. Now during that six month period Joe Calzaghe, now he'd been out with a hand injury but He showed that there was no effects in his bout against Byron Mitchell in an absolute two-round war. After that fight, Calzaghe explained his reasons for the toe-to-toe bout against Mitchell and he said, That was down to six months of frustration as this fight had been postponed two times so there was a lot of anger in that ring. I went a bit mad in there for the first two rounds but I'm sure the crowd loved it. Calzaghe hit the deck for the first time in his career but when Mitchell went for the finish in the second, he was caught with an almighty left hook that put him down hard. Mitchell valiantly managed to get back onto his feet, but a further assault from Calzaghe forced the referee to stop the contest. Although Mitchell did admit that the ref was probably right to stop the fight when he did by saying, I thought it was stopped a little bit prematurely, but the referee was looking out for my best interests. Frank Warren was more than happy with Joe's performance in front of an American television audience and he said, this is the fight that will launch Joe big time in the States. Then in Edinburgh, Scotland on October the 22nd, 2004, Calzaghe picked himself up from the canvas after a flash knockdown in the fourth round to outpoint the Egyptian-American Cabaret Salim who was 23-3. and After returning to his feet, Calzaghe dominated, knocking Salim down in the 12th and final round. And after the fight, Calzaghe said, I thought I learnt my lesson against Byron Mitchell, but I got caught again. My hands were down, my chin was in the air, and I was caught off balance. In the Mitchell fight, I was stunned, but in this one, I was embarrassed. I got straight back up, and when I was okay, I started using my boxing skills. Yeah, Kazaki, I think he admitted to taking his eye off the ball in those games. He just he just failed to, to failed to get that motivation to, to want to get up for those fights. He just they just weren't big enough names for him. So. Uh, I think that's probably that was his problem. He took his eye off the ball, uh, took his eye off the game, and got caught a couple of times. Got put down. But jumping back to Kessa, and Kessa finally got his chance to fight for a major title on November 12, 2004, after his stablemate and fellow Dane Mads Larson got injured in training while preparing to challenge Manny Seeker, who was eighteen and four, for the WBA super middleweight title in Copenhagen. Now Kessler was offered the opportunity to take his place and he accepted the contest with open arms. It took place at the Bromby Hallen in Bromby, Denmark and it was a very, very dominant display from Kessler who forced Seeker to retire in his corner after round seven, handing Kessler his first world title and the beginning of his three-year reign as champion. Now, to kickstart his reign, Kessler was ordered to take his mandatory defence in Sydney, Australia, uh, after his team actually lost out on purse bids uh, to to stage the fight originally in Denmark. Now, his opponent was Anthony Mundine, who was 23-2, and and that took place on June 8, 2005. Now, the two defeats that the Australian actually had on his record were against the German Sven Otke, who uh, actually finished his career undefeated, if no one knew that, and uh, Manny Seeker. So, you know, decent names that he had lost to. So this was going to be no easy fight for Kessler. The fight, well, it went the 12-round distance for Kessler, uh, and he came through a tough but a clear-cut unanimous decision victory. Kessler explained years later what Mundane was like to fight against. And he said, at that time, he was good, but he was a strange fighter, an awkward fighter. He was fast. Well, he got, he got through the fight and he won his first toll. Terrific performance from Kessler. And Kessler made his second defence, this time on home soil, against Eric Lucas, 38-6, on January 14, 2006, in front of his adoring fans, once again in Bromby, Denmark. Now, jumping back to Calzaghe. Calzaghe was back on the road for only the second time of his career. He was travelling to Germany to fight Mario V. But now, uh, for the second time, it's a rematch. 30, 41 and 1 now, uh, Mario V. He was a mandatory challenger and he stopped him in the sixth round. He was then back in Cardiff on September 10, 2005, where Joe battered Evans Azira for 12 rounds uh, with a broken hand as well, which he actually sustained in the third. So I think he probably would have taken him out a little bit earlier if he didn't break his hand. Then his next fight was a scheduled unification belt 
against a certain Jeff Lacey, who was also undefeated 21 and 0. Now, that was originally set for November 4th, 2005, but due to that break he sustained in his last fight to his uh, metacarpal in the left hand, it was cancelled or delayed. Uh, Warren successfully managed to reschedule that fight for March 5th, 2006. The two unbeaten world champions, well, they faced off in a rare unification match in front of 16,000 fans in Manchester in the biggest super middleweight fight since Jones Jr. and James Tony in 1994. And all I'm going to say is, obviously, Carol Zaggy won. It was absolutely superb. We have done a legendary night on this fight, so please do go back and listen to the tale of Carol Zaggy Lacey if you haven't already. But... What a performance from Joe Calzaghe that was. The most defining performance of his career, barring maybe this one that we're going to be referring to, of course. We'll talk about this actual fight itself a little bit later. But yeah, Calzaghe Lacey, we've done the Legendary Nights, guys. Season one, please go back and check it if you haven't already checked it out. It's a great episode. One of our favourites. One of the greatest British performances in a ring by a boxer from this show. We really, really enjoyed doing that. So please do go and check that one out. Now, on October... The 14th, 2006, Mikhail Kessler was elevated to the WBA super champion status and he took on the WBC champion, Marcus Bayer, who was 34-2-1 at the Park and Stadium in a unification battle. The fight was aired live on American television and Kessler seized his opportunity to impress the HBO viewers with a superb performance against the German veteran. It took him just three rounds to knock out Bayer using his piston-like jab and landing his trademark right hand. He found the target on numerous occasions to claim his second world title at 168 pounds and go 38 and 0 with 29 knockouts. Now, someone mentioned that he had picked a a good fight for his American television debut, and Kessler replied, "It is not television; it is HBO. Now I can say I'm on the same television network as The Sopranos." His manager, Mogens Pally, was impressed with his performance, saying, "Mikel fought almost perfectly." If this fight did not impress HBO, then nothing will. Mikhail did more than dominate. He was a wrecking ball from the opening bell. His right hand was powerful and accurate. Now we will look at all our attractive options. The most prestigious of all is an undisputed fight, of course, with Joe Calzaghe, who at the time was 42-0. And Kessler said he has no fears about facing the other undefeated world champion in his division. And he said, I would be glad to fight Joe under the right financial conditions. I would go to England or he could come to Denmark. I will beat him in either place. I had said that Floyd Mayweather is boxing's best pound for pound and that I am the second best fighter in the sport. I think I demonstrated that to some people here tonight. I will fight anyone who is out there. Now, Morgan's daughter, Bettina Pali, agreed with her father's assessment and she said that was an outstanding showing by Mikhail. It must be a bit frightening for his opponents, but Mikhail seems to be getting better and better throughout each fight. On the same night, and broadcast live on HBO, Joe Calzaghe fought the tough Cameroon Australian Saki Obika 21-2 at the MEN Arena in Manchester. It was a pretty of a dirty fight because Bika had two points deducted for headbutts, one of which led to a severe cut over Calzaghe's left eye, which would cause him problems for the duration of the bout. However, Calzaghe managed to come through that really tough fight and win by a clear decision. But of course he was disappointed with his performance, especially with it being viewed by the American audience, which he was eager to impress. And he said, he, as in Beak, is not the best fighter I've fought, but he wasn't the bloody easiest. I am always down on myself when I don't perform. But anyone who knows anything about boxing could see that Beaker was no fall guy. He was dirty, but I stuck it out in the trenches and I showed I am not a pitter-patter paper champion who just wins when he's on top. Great words there from Kelzegger. You could tell he was frustrated by that. And sort of Kessler, well, he, he outshone him on this HBO, live on HBO for the American audience. And, well, Kelzegger was aware that his performance was not good as Kessler's annihilation over Bayer. But he was quick to point out, this was Kelzegger, that the German was not what he was perceived to be by the media. And this is what Kelzegger said. He said, Mikel Kessler's just taking the credit for that tonight. Knocking Bayer out in the third round. they That's what they said. I knew he'd beat Bayer. He was a guy just looking for one last payday. I knew Kessa was going to smash him up. Bayer was shot. Yet yeah, I bet I'll get criticised for going the distance with a so-called journeyman. He was clearly pissed off that he just couldn't. He didn't look as good, basically, uh, as we've seen before, with, with uh, which we'll talk about, you know, in this fight and, and also 
the Lacey fight, he can, you know, he was just pissed off of himself. And well, Michael Marley, the American agent who was actually working for the Pellas uh, and Kessa, said HBO should be complimented for having the wisdom to be uh, the first to showcase Kessa on US television, plus the Calzaghi Beaker fight. And in his own words, he said, uh, I think it was a brilliant stroke by Ross Greenberg, Kerry Davis, and Louis Barragan at HBO to put three uh, world super middleweight champions, all of them non-Americans, on their airways in one night. So American fight fans could compare and contrast their merits. Kawasaki won his title bout, yes, and he's a great champion. But Mogan's pal predicted that Kessler would look a million dollars, and he sure did just that. There can be no doubt as to who stole the HBO show on this night. Talks about a fight between Joe Calzaghe and Mikhail Kessler were now top of everyone's agenda. But negotiations were actually put on hold until Kessler successfully defended his titles against the WBC mandatory challenger, who was Librado Andre, uh, undefeated fighter at 24-0. On March 24th, 2007, at the Parkin Stadium, Kessler made a successful defence of that WBA Super and WBC titles by unanimous decision with all three judges scoring it 120 to 108. The Great Dane spoke after the fight and complained that the uh, Welshman spoke more about facing the likes of Bernard Hopkins or Roy Jones Jr. rather rather than face his nearest rival in a division. And this is what he said. He said, I don't know why Joe continues to call out Roy Jones Jr., and Hopkins and, and and these other guys. I believe I'm the best super middleweight in the world. Joe disagrees with me. Fine, but let's settle it where it should be settled, in the boxing ring. He should want what the fans want, which is that he and I get it on. Joe knows in his heart he cannot beat me. Well, uh, Bettina Powell then told the BBC Sport, and this is an article that we picked up, and that the negotiations had been initiated with Frank Warren about uh, Kessler fighting Joe Calzaghe. Now, while the Dane would prefer the fight in Copenhagen, he was, in fact, willing to travel for the right price with the uh, Cardiff Millennium Stadium being the likely venue. But after almost giving the green light, Powell stressed that the talks were at a very early stage and that the IBF, the WBO, the WBC and the WBA, they all needed to be contacted. But it was good to know that they were in discussions and Kessler was ready to move. Neither of these fighters hadn't really fought out of their own backyards, to be fair. So someone had to give. In the meantime, Calzaghe, well, he decided to take on the US TV boxing reality star, star of the contender, Peter Manfredo, 26-3, and rather than defend his IBF title against the mandatory challenger, Robert Stieglitch. He said it's disappointing to give up the IBF, but Stieglitz doesn't mean anything outside of Germany. Frank Warren also agreed with this decision, saying American broadcasters HBO had no appetite for the Stieglitz fight, and that's how the belts get fragmented. On April 7th, 2007, Calzaghe stopped Manfredo in three rounds in front of a British indoor record crowd of 35,000 people at the Millennium Stadium. It was his 20th title defence that drew him level with Bernard Hopkins and Larry Holmes, and moving him within five of Joe Lewis's record. After that victory, Calzaghe stated, I'm disappointed that I fractured my hand, but that's boxing and injuries happen. I shouldn't be out for too long, though probably about four weeks. And then I'll be back to light training in preparation for the proposed July date, which I'm really excited about. His next fight scheduled in for July was supposed to be against Russian challenger Dennis Inklin. Although a middleweight super champion Jermaine Taylor was his preferred opponent, with Hopkins the other one. Joe did admit in his book that at this stage of his career, he was weighing up his options, whether it was time to call it a day or not. So he needed the big fights to get him motivated. And he said, I want big fights, another super fight. I don't want routine title defences because it's hard psychologically to keep getting myself up for each fight. I'm aware that my opponent is always dangerous. And I know that if I underestimate him, I could get beaten. But it's difficult to be constantly motivated for defence after defence unless the opponent can light my fire. And he started to relight his fire. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> we're going to jump in that. The negotiations and the build-up and, well, the sort of war of words. Um, so this is the next section 
of of, of this uh, legendary night. And well, the fight was originally set for September, something that I didn't know, to be honest with you. I just always assumed it was November. And the actual contest was being billed by those in America, probably more than anything, as the biggest unification bout since the welterweight clash between Sugar Ray Leonard and Tommy Hearns in 1981. Just like that fight, there were some bumps along the way in agreeing this deal. Now, Morgan's Pelly explained that it was down to the fact that he wanted the fight to take place in Denmark. But of course, Frank Warren, well, he wanted the fight to take place in Cardiff. And as we said earlier, neither of these guys were really too keen about leaving their own backyards. Well, Powell said that once he realised that Calzaghi had absolutely no intentions whatsoever of fighting in Denmark, he had to make a decision. And this is what he said. He said, this fight would only take place if it was here in Cardiff. We realised that quickly. Calzaghi won't leave. Who is he beating? Peter Manfredo is a clown. He's not a fighter. He should find another sport. Jeff Lacey is another pathetic American fighter. In the ring, he was pathetic and as slow as a turtle. <laughs> I think Kessa's promoter probably does a little bit more trash talking than Kessa does, as we'll get into in a sec. But according to Kessa, he actually put the, ba- the blame squarely on Calzaghi's shoulders. And he said, I've wanted to fight for two years, but Joe won't come out of his country. When the fight was eventually finalised to take place in Cardiff, Calzaghi told the BBC, this is the only fight I want because a victory over Mikel Kessler will mean the most to my career at this point. It will mean more than, than the beating I gave Jeff Lacey and even more than the win over Chris Eubank, which began my world title reign 10 years ago. I'm number one in the division today and I'll be number one in the division after we fight on November 3rd. Can't come quick enough. Frank Warren, of course, who was over the moon with the deal he had negotiated, which was one of, if not still the most expensive fight he ever promoted, he said, I can't think of two guys who are undefeated and both at the top of their game who are scheduled to meet each other. This fight is very evenly balanced. I'm excited about it and I think it's the best fight I've put together in the last 20 years. There's no doubt about it. We're setting the Millennium Stadium out for 60,000 people. We got 35,000 people there last time. Outside of the heavyweight fights I've been involved in, this will be the most expensive bout I've put on in terms of purses. This is probably the biggest fight in the world at the moment. Warren had spent a hefty amount, of course, he needed to reclaim some of that money back and he wasn't going to get it back through just the gate receipts. Over the past couple of years, Calzaghi's fights had been broadcast on ITV, but for the Kessler fight, Warren's sports network decided to sign a new deal with the pay satellite station Satanta. And Warren spoke of this new deal and he said, I'm delighted to be teaming up with Santanta, who are now major players on the sports broadcasting scene. I was impressed with their coverage of Ricky Hatton's recent fight against Jose Luis Castillo, and know they have a knowledgeable and highly skilled boxing team working for them. Calzaghi Castler is probably the biggest and most important fight involving a British boxer since I began promoting, and having Santanta on board will help make it a show to surpass all others held in the UK. Well... He was a little bit wrong about his prediction against Santanta because they folded after a couple of years, didn't they? He did, yes. It had to disappear. I was just about to say that. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Let's hope BT don't go the same way. The fight, uh, it it was also agreed to be broadcast on HBO in the United States with the network actually paying a reported $3 million license fee and spent another seven figures for marketing and production. It was also shown on HDTV and in Spanish language on HBO Latino. For this reason, the fight would be an early morning start to accommodate the American audience. I, I believe it's probably just after 1 a.m. in the morning, 1.30, something like that. Now, with the backing from HBO, the fight wasn't the only thing that needed to sell the fight, so public appearances would be needed to promote the fight to more than the die-hard fight fans. But Kessler refused to attend press conferences in the United States. For that, he was criticised and actually dubbed as the invisible man by the American media. But he did meet initial demands months before for press conferences in New York and in Cardiff. Kessler was certainly the fight's quiet man, which led to conspiracy theories in the weeks leading up to the fight, or probably less than a week leading up to the fight. Many thought that Kessler's lack of sparring at the end of his training camp was due to a hand problem. 
and that was indeed something that Kessa himself later disclosed when he retired. He actually told Tris Dixon on Life Stories that he broke his hand one month before the fight. Now, others suggested that he had been actually secretly training for 13 weeks and he had overtrained. Once again, Kessa spoke to Tris Dixon and he was saying that he trained hard. A likely six to eight week training camp in Monte Carlo or in Copenhagen when he actually was told that uh, Calzaghi got injured. So he's training away eight, six weeks and then Calzaghi gets injured. So that fight gets postponed from September to, to November. So he's got two months. And in Kessa's own words, he said, they cancelled the first date and we fought in November. I remember having a break for just a week because I was training so hard. I didn't want to overtrain. And that was the reason why I took a break. Then I came back on on the track and every time I was out running or boxing I was thinking just of Joe Calzaghi so I think some of, there's some truth to to his how it was going for Kessa but I think probably the, the broken hand he may have wanted to try and keep it under wraps so probably that's why he didn't show up to some conferences and stuff Very interesting isn't it when he told that story on Trish Dixon's Boxing Life stories because it wasn't something that was made public knowledge to be honest with you until that particular episode nope. so all these years later Trish Dixon does the interview with him and he tells him that he actually broke his hand in the lead up to it which I found quite interesting looking back you know at the fight and looking back on the fight it makes you sort of look at it in a different light really but the, the build up to this fight there wasn't really a lot of needle in fact there was quite a lack of needle between the two mainly because Kessler would refu- refuse to take the bait from his opponent and he refused to get involved in any of the trash talking and he said I'm not a bad guy I do like to talk about the fight. I'm just not much of a trash talker. And that was not a problem for Cal Zaghi, who said, I'm glad Kessler showed up. I was afraid he was going to have to place a missing fighters report with Scotland Yard. He then went on to call Kessler one-dimensional. And Kessler responded by saying, He didn't say that to my face. He didn't say a word. I've always been a nice guy. But I always tell people a nice guy is the baddest guy. He then admitted that he was nervous before what he called the biggest fight of my career. You have to be nervous. But I couldn't be stronger than I am now. I had no injuries, no sick days for five months. I'm ready. Of course, we know that now to be a little bit of bullshit because he'd injured his hand before the fight. <laughs> uh, in the lead up to the fight, Kessler, who is seven years Carl Zaghi's junior, spoke confidently of fighting the man who had been champion for a decade. And he said, I'm young and fresh and my career has gone so well up to this point. It's a dream come true and a big step up for me now. We are two unbeaten champions and it's going to be a great fight. When asked to pinpoint a weakness in his opponent that he intended to exploit, Kessler said, His age. But I'm not saying I have to meet an old guy. Joe's a great fighter and a gentleman. He has always kept himself in good shape and looked good in his last fights. And he is a great fighter and I know we'll have a great, hard fight. Kessler then went on to tell The Telegraph, This fight could change my life, everything. I have studied Calzaghi. Joe's force is to come forward, throw a lot of punches, be fast and to spoil one's boxing. That's his plan. My plan is a secret. So the lack of trash talk uh, didn't take away the magnitude of the fight. Kessler's rise in the boxing ring made him Denmark's biggest sports star. And in 2006, he was voted for the of the year in Denmark. Now to escape the fame and the limelight, he decided to spend most of the year in Monaco. When training began for the fight, it would start in his new adopted home and then he would return to Denmark and complete his camp. Although, making sure he always kept a low profile, just visiting close friends and having his traditional breakfast with mum, something he always did. His nation loved him and believed in him, which put a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on his shoulders for one man. And like Kessler, well, Kalzaghi, he was the biggest star in his country. In Wales, their most prized game was, and still probably is rugby, uh, the national side had one of their worst years ever. They were actually knocked out of the World Cup in Fiji, which we went to the top of the show, in the group stages uh, two months before that fight. Their football team was struggling badly and they weren't going to be qualified for Euro 2008, leaving in England. Their domestic football sides, well, uh, they weren't in the best shape either. Uh, Swansea had just got promoted from League One and, uh, well, Cardiff, they finished mid-table in the championships. Although Cardiff's fortunes did change. They actually made the FA Cup final, losing to Portsmouth the following year. So Joe, look, just, just to make it clear, Joe Calzaghi and Kessa, they were the pride of their nation. Joe Calzaghi carried the hopes of his nations on his shoulders and that's why, you know, he's also named the pride of Wales because quite simply, Joe had to do it for the, for, the, for those fans, for that nation to make them feel proud again. 
So we're moving to the weigh-in and the fight details before we get into the breakdown of the fight. And I don't know if many people know this fact, but Kessler is actually half English. His mother, Anne, was from Salisbury in Wiltshire. And Kessler wore shorts for the fight with a Union Jack flag next to a Danish one. And Kessler said, I'm just as British as Joe Calzaghe. But going in there into the ring in Cardiff is going to be an experience. I fought in Australia. There were 15,000 people booing me. I'm used to it. And I thought, I'll show them. I'm not nervous. Maybe I will on the day of the weigh-in. I'm really looking forward to it. As expected, a huge crowd did attend the weigh-in and Kessler was shocked to see such a large crowd and admitted to being a bit overwhelmed, although he did not show it. South Park has Aggie weighed in at 166.5 pounds and accumulated 43 wins, 0 defeats and 32 knockouts and was 35 years old at the time they got into the ring. He held the WBO Super Middleweight title and was making his 21st defence and he also held the ring Super Middleweight title, making his third defence of that. Calzaghe, of course, as we said earlier, had vacated the IBF title, which he'd won against Jeff Lacey, so this wasn't on the line and he stood at 6 foot tall with a 73 inch reach. The right hander Kessler, he weighed in a little over, so he had to remove clothing to make the weight, but he did and he hit the scales at £168 on the button. With a record of 39 wins, 0 defeats and 29 knockouts, he was at the age of 28, arguably in his prime. He was the WBA super middleweight champion, making his fifth defence and the WBC champion, making his second defence. He was an inch taller and had a, an inch reach advantage. Between them, they had a staggering combined record of 82 wins with 61 by way of knockout. Now Kessler, he looked slightly bigger up on the stage at the weigh-in when both fighters went head-to-head -head at the face-off. Kessler, though, was unable to keep a straight face. He would do his talking in the ring. These are the final words from the fighters going into the fight. Joe Calzaghe said, I feel really confident this is going to be a fantastic occasion. And Kessler said, My career has built up to this. This is my defining moment. I know how to beat him and I will become the undisputed super middleweight champion of the world. <laughs> He is boxing's longest reigning current champion. I am Joe Calzaghe, undefeated. Who now faces fellow undefeated title holder, Mikkel Kessler. You may not know me, but I am a champion. Not so long ago, this 168 pound unification fight between Wales' Joe Calzaghe and Denmark's Mikkel Kessler would have gone unnoticed outside of Europe. A title holder since 1997, Calzaghe needed a 2006 conquest of highly regarded American Jeff Lacey to launch his international reputation. Calzaghe begins to hammer it home. The Welsh icon's stature continued to grow as his streak of title defenses reached 20. Within the borders of Denmark lurks an even more unfamiliar national hero. Miguel Kessler dominant in Denmark. Hailing from a nation with scant boxing history, Kessler's march destruction of then undefeated Librato Andrade thrust his name worldwide. With an aggregate record of 82 and 0, Calzaghe versus Kessler is no longer just a European novelty. Will Welsh fans witness continued dominance from their local hero? I'll stay the best in the world. Or can a Dane travel across the North Sea and make a great statement in hostile territory? I worked for this fight my whole life. It's prime time for the 168 pounders. 60,000 fans are expected in Millennium Stadium in Cardiff, Wales, as Joe Calzaghe takes on Mikel Kessler. So, November 3rd, 2007, at the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff, under the roof, the largest indoor boxing event in European history was about to take place. The man in the middle called of the action was Michael Tager, and the three judges were John Stewart, Massimo Baravicino and Raul Chiaz Sr. Jim Lampley. Uh, we're going to paint the picture from Jim Lampley. The, you know, the, the HBO America love to just plug a fight. And Jim Lampley, well, he began the HBO coverage with his, in his usual exciting way. And this is what he said. He said, it's Europe's version of Leonard Hearns 1 or De La Hoya Trinidad. Two unbeaten fighters. Near enough in ability, near enough to the peaks of their respective careers that is almost impossible to anticipate anything other than a close competitive perhaps epic fight in 116 years of gloved prized fighting never has a battle between two europeans arose such excitement and anticipation 
They're angled toward each other for more than a year. And now for Joe Calzaghe and Mikel Kessa, the hour of decision arrives. He then added, Welcome to a scenario and a set of circumstances so vivid in detail that William Shakespeare himself might have been proud to conceive it. An unbeaten Dane against an unbeaten Welshman, three nights after All Hollows Eve, before 50,000 zealots on a rugby pitch in Wales for supremacy in a 168 pound weight class all around the world. Great work. Uh, love, love that. Absolutely love that. Max Kenneman went in and spoke about the history of the super middleweight division. And he said the division itself is not even 25 years old. It's only been around since 84. And therefore, this is the first super middleweight super fight in the history of boxing. Roy Jones and James Tony had a big fight in this division. But for them, it was merely a stopover on their way from middleweight to ultimately the heavyweight division. This is what you must know. Joe Calzaghe is a super middleweight champion of the world. Forget the belts. Kessler is the number one contender. They're both unbeaten. Tonight, they are not only vying for the 168 pound supremacy, but indeed for entry in the pound for pound discussion alongside names like Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather Jr. Got to love HBO, man. Yeah, that's a great way to, to hype up a fight and... I'm pretty sure, you know, listening back to Jim Lampley and Max Kellerman tell it, you know, the way we've managed to insert this into the episode, we can't always do it the justice that they can, but we always have oh, to no. put it out there. You know, come on, we've <laughs> got to we've got to try our best impressions. It's We're um... certainly not. I'm, I'm <laughs> certainly not no Jim Lampley. I'll tell you that. Well, an absolute legend, but wow. Uh, you've got to put it in. Uh, but, might have been better if you'd have probably said that bit. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what, you no, know, listening back to it, listening back to the way they've worded it, listening back to both of them speak the way they have, it, you know, knowing this is so many years ago, it even gets me excited thinking about it. Just, just going through that, that section that you've just read through with both of them introducing the show, introducing the fight. It's, it just makes you realise how big of a fight it really, really was. Now, Kessler, he was the bigger hitter in this bout. And Calzaghe, well, of course, he had the faster hands. And when Emmanuel Stewart was asked, who usually comes out on top in this type of fight, he said, in most cases, the guy with the faster hands. He accumulates points, especially when the bout goes to a decision. This is not the normal case tonight. Kessler is a more accurate puncher, good balance, good fundamentals, which I love. And even though Calzaghe throws a lot of punches, a lot of different good movements, I think there's superstar quality in both of these guys, and it's going to be a very tight fight. He then added, Champions have a certain arrogance, a certain way they walk, a certain swagger, and both of these guys have that. They feel and think like champions, and that's what champions are made of inside. We have two superstars tonight in their own minds. It's going to be a good fight. Now, once both fighters arrived in the ring and following the Danish and the Welsh national anthems, it was the unmistakable tones of Michael Buffer that got the already loud crowd into an even wilder frenzy with his famous rally cry of, let's get ready to rumble. (laughs) Kessler remembers that moment that Michael Buffer announced his name and he said, I couldn't hear him. So I didn't know when to raise my hand. I'd never had that before in my career. I thought there were about 6,000 that had come over from Denmark and where are they now? I couldn't hear them. Then I thought to myself, what the fuck are you doing here? Oh shit, what have I done? (laughs) Ah, that's brilliant. (laughs) Definitely sounding Cardiff there. It uh, It sounded like an amazing atmosphere just watching it back on YouTube. So God knows what it was like in there. Um, Couldn't even hear himself think. The fight, the fight itself. Let's jump into it. Starting from rounds one to three. So in a high paced and fascinating opening round, Kawasaki came out fast with the upright Kessler asserting a strong jab and landing the left-right combinations. He refused to be drawn in and shrugged off Kawasaki's advances and stood firm while landing a couple of decent right. Now, Calzaghe struggled to establish himself, even though he threw a lot more punches than Kessler and even caught him with a good left to the body. But he was getting caught often with good counter punches on his way out. Now, there was a there was little to choose between the pair, but Kessler settled into the fight quicker, which gave him the edge over Calzaghe, who wasted a lot on nervous energy. 
And that was the first round. So into the second round, and Calzaghe found himself backpedaling after Kessler landed one big right hand and followed it up with a sharp left lead. Sustained pressure from Calzaghe in the third round had the pro Welsh crowd chanting, you're not singing anymore <laughs> to the Danish fans who the 6,000 of them or 5,000 of them, they actually found their voices in those first two rounds uh, in those early exchanges. And uh, yeah, the Welsh fans started battling back in that sort of football chanting, love all that, great stuff that. It's great to listen to. And But back to the fight. And Calzaghe seemed to be inserting himself with some flurries and forcing Kessler around the ring, which resulted in the Dane actually slipping to the canvas. And, you know, you're not singing anymore. Next thing, the crowd are roaring. When Kessler hit the deck thinking it was a knockdown, but it wasn't. It was actually correctly ruled as a slip by referee Mike Ortega. Their hero had just stepped on Kessler's foot. Uh, the inevitable tangle footwork when a lefty meets a right-hander. Uh, Kawasaki showed his confidence in this round uh, when he actually threw a bolo punch as well before landing with a right hand and then three sharp lefts. The very last punch that was thrown from Kessler it doesn't look like much. It's a right hand, right on the bell to the chest of Calzaghe. Well, he had later admitted that I had a bad chest for about seven months. That's how hard Mikel hits. <laughs> yeah, it's a big right hand. If you go back and watch it at the end of that third, it's a really, really hard right hand. And uh, you can tell it hurt him. He just kind of managed to keep it, you know, he kept it under wraps pretty well, to be honest with you. But for he- for hearing him say that after the, after the fight, Wow, it's just got to show you how hard of a punch Mikhail Kessler was. Now, moving into rounds four to six, in the fourth, Calzaghe walked into a right hand, and moments later, the first of two perfectly timed uppercuts buzzed Calzaghe to his core. It was the moment that you really got to see Calzaghe grit down hard on his gum shield. Yeah. The Welshman, he, you know, he, he really had to smother Kessler, and... That opportunity presented itself. He held on for dear life at that point. And, well, for Kessler, it was a classy round. It ignited the Danish fans and it silenced the home crowd. From round five onwards, Kalzaghi began to take over the fight. Now, the fifth was a little bit quieter, but Kalzaghi did do the better work, bouncing in and out of range and making Kessler miss. He switched up his tactics with a variety of hard shots, excellent defensive work and more energy. Working behind his jab and throwing punches from different angles, it left Kessler bemused. And Calzaghe, he nicked the six on work rate alone, using good advice from his dad in the corner. He fought at range, and he controlled the pace with his right lead. And it was great to see Calzaghe then, at this point, starting to, to take a little bit of control from the fight, with them early exchanges being quite a difficult few rounds for Joe Calzaghe. Yeah, definitely. I think Kessler took the first, First two, at the first four, he definitely had three for me. Uh, and then obviously, Kazagi slowly, he switched up the tactics from round five. And he was starting to, to claw those rounds back and into round seven and nine. And Kazagi, well, he continued where he left off with the sixth. And he seized control at the beginning of the seventh, leading or landing some sharp combinations before sending home that wicked overhand right that rocked Kessler's head back. Now, however, Kessler returned fire, landing a, a couple of Hefty rights and an uppercut. Another close round to score with Calzaghe throwing more, but Kessler landing the cleaner punches. It was up to you. What what, what's, what, did, what did you prefer, really? The eighth round was Calzaghe's best, but Kessler started the stronger, landing a couple of solid right hands. Calzaghe regained his composure. He landed with some great right combinations. A, a body shot took the wind out of Kessler, but he managed to suck it up and see out the danger. He was actually assisted. He was clearly hurt, but he was assisted by the referee who called a break when Calzaghe was in the ascendancy for rabbit punching. Uh, those valuable seconds allowed Kessler to get his breath back and was enough time for him to recover. After the fight, he does say that he really, that was the fight. That was the, that was a shot that really hurt him. Uh, he was never going to go down, but that hurt him. The Dane was beginning to show signs of fatigue, but the, as the body punches throughout the fight began to take effect and Calzaghe maintained his attacks. Into the ninth, and it was a bit of a messy affair in a round that turned into a battle of wills rather than skills. Clean shots from both fighters were non-existent, but Kessler was not throwing much lever, whereas Calzaghe showed more work rate. He even dropped his hands, baiting the big punching Dane to let loose. 
a sign of confidence or stupidity. I'm sure Enzo would have said the latter. <laughs> yeah, he definitely would have bloody said the latter. You can, I can just hear in my own mind now Enzo shouting at him just in that really thick sort of Welsh Italian accent that he had, and he, he's just, <laughs> I could, you can just imagine it right now, couldn't you? The late great Enzo Calzaghe. Did you realize that? Yeah, yeah, you could just imagine it. You really can. So we move into the championship rounds of the fight, and the tenth round was another fast-paced battle. Calzaghe had Kessler backpedalling for the first time in the fight with some flurries as he came on strong down the final stretch. Kessler did land with two solid rights, but that was Calzaghe's incredible fitness that won the round with Kessler looking a little bit ragged. The 11th was all about the work on the inside from Calzaghe. While fighting in the pocket, he sent home a couple of sharp uppercuts while he was inside. Kessler had looked like he'd run out of ideas and the big left hook from Calzaghe left him even more puzzled. Calzaghe was now having fun in the ring and he was showing off to the crowd and impressing the judges with a bit of showboating as he as he used to do in, in some of his fights. Many watching on were obviously more nervous than the Welsh Dragon because they knew that Kessler had it in him to knock their man out and take that win at any point. Frank Warren was even encouraging his fighter to get his hands up. The last round was all about Kessler going for broke and trying to land his big right hand but he just couldn't find the target because... Calzaghe, really confident and just very elusive. And he controlled things from range and he, he actually let loose with a couple of combinations. But Kessler did manage to get through with a big right hand and a solid right uppercut. But Calzaghe, he demonstrated an excellent chin, taking the shots well. And instead of getting on his bike and staying out of range like he should have done, he came back with more flurries. It wasn't enough to win the round as Kessler, for us, probably took it with some solid shots, including the two hefty right crosses. Kessler's round, but this was Calzaghe's fight. At the final bell, both men embraced. Calzaghe raised his hands while Kessler walked back to his corner, shaking his head. The body language in a fight, it just says it all sometimes, and it's all you need to know. And for this one, that was evident at the end there that there was only one winner. And the final verdict from the judges who scored the fight was 117-111, 116-112, and another 116-112, all in favour of the new undisputed super middleweight champion, Joe Calzaghe. Ladies and gentlemen, in case you're wondering what a great fighter looks like, he looks exactly like this. Joe, congratulations. Rate this performance compared to other performances in your career. It's difficult to say, you know, judging by the opponent, he was a fantastic opponent, very strong, caught me some good punches, you know, but... uh, it has to be an excellent performance, you know, Michael Kessler, the peak of his powers. I'm 35, nearly 36, you know, and uh, he's still pulled out the hat. I'm tremendously proud of this performance. Has to read up there with, obviously, Jeff Lacey and Eubanks. But it's up to you guys, you know, I haven't seen him back on the tape. I, I struggled a bit at the end, you know, but I felt it was a good pace. Controlled the fight. We all make mistakes, you know, I got a bit careless at times, but hey, that's what makes me excited, man. Uh, in the first couple of rounds, I actually thought that Kessler was fighting very well. And uh, right around the fourth... To me, it appeared you seemed to turn the fight. Was that the case? What did you do? Did you change tactics at all during the fight? Well, basically, you know, maybe it was a bit tentative. I was trying to get my jab to work. I I see that he was waiting for the right hand. But my dad said I was, you know, my dad said I was maybe losing a bit too much um, respect for him and basically making him feel my power. So I, I, I become more offensive and I caught him with a good body shot. I think in the fourth round he winced a bit. And I think when he commanded his respect, he thought, thought twice. And I felt I controlled the fight from then on where I was using my jab, putting some good punches in. Obviously, I had to dig deep in there. He caught me some good shots. He's a very, very talented Did fighter. he ever hurt you? Um, I wouldn't say hurt, but stun me. You know, that's boxing. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna see the alarm bells ringing, but that's what makes me an exciting fighter, man, because I always come back. You know, when I'm wounded, I come back twice as hard as I proved again tonight. Did your dad say you have to shine? At some point, he said you had to do something. I didn't hear it quite. I think he just meant command the ring a bit more, you know, be the general. Sometimes maybe it was moving and let him control the fight. But as soon as I stepped in and started unleashing some good body shots, he definitely felt the body, body shots. Yeah, I felt some of his shots, but believe me, he felt some of my slaps tonight. Uh, in the 12th round, you had the fight won. You were fighting a desperate fighter, a top fighter, throwing bombs. You didn't back off. You didn't hold him. You continued to fight. Why? Because that's, that's who I am. I'm a warrior. And at the end of the day, it's, it's what's inside of me. I've never been a fighter to hold. I've never been a fighter to run. I'm here to entertain. I'm, here, I'm a fighter in my blood. So maybe it's careless. Who knows? If I got dropped, then it'd be the biggest mistake of my life. But uh, it's who I am. You know, it's a crowd, what, what the crowd want to see. You know, I give it my all. I give 110% every time I step in the ring. And that's who I am. Great performance. It really was um, 
Calzaghe was uh, sublime. From from round four onwards, it is again one of the best performances in his career. You could you could you could say Lacey Lacey he does it for twelve rounds. So you know, I suppose for me, uh, in a complete performance, it probably is the Jeff Lacey fight. But Kessler's a better fighter than Lacey, and Kessler was good. He was very good. Just Calzaghe was outstanding. It's just levels. It really was, as they say. Calzaghe's legacy. Well, it was secured with this dominant victory over Kessler and. And we pulled out Dan Raphael, who wrote about the performance of Calzaghe on ESPN.com. And this is what he said. He said, what else can you call Calzaghe's performance other than pure brilliance? In front of a monster crowd of 50,150 fans in his home country, Calzaghe 35 punched his Hall of Fame ticket with a dominant victory in an exciting fight against an outstanding opponent. It's not that Kessler, 28-year-old Viking warrior from Denmark, fought poorly. It's that Calzaghe was that good. There could be no question that Calzaghe is the supreme commander of the 168-pound division in all the world. And it is not a reach to call him the greatest fighter in the 23-year history of the division. It's either Calzaghe or Roy Jones Jr. But Jones, stay up. At 168, when it was brief, just two years and five defenses. So, I think uh, I think the reason why we put that in is because Dan Raphael it hits it on the it's it hits the nail on the head. Is Joe Calzaghe the greatest super middleweight even now? I mean, it's 2007. Uh, I think he probably is. I don't think there's anyone better than Joe Calzaghe super middleweight, and I think that this this tonight proved that. I think that night did prove it. I think that was one of his defining performances i mean we, we did the, the lacy episode obviously legendary nights calzaghe lacy and we talked about the significance of that fight for joe's career but then when you look at how old he was at the time he was 35 against a 28 year old he was going in against the wba wbc champion uh, essentially people looking at it like you know maybe this is going to be the night where the older man gets dethroned by the younger more hungrier fresher man and it wasn't to be. That night was an unbelievable performance from, from Joe Calzaghe after a few rocky moments early on. And he controlled the fight. He won the fight. And he shown that he was, as Dan Raphael put it, he was the supreme commander of the 168-pound division. And yeah, people argue that Roy Jones is one of the best super middleweights of all time. But I think when you read the extract that Dan Raphael wrote and you look at it like, well, hang on, he was only there two years and he only made five defences... People argue that Joe Calzaghe made 21 defences of a lightly regarded WBO title. But yeah, look at the guys he fought in in the prime. Jeff Lacey was in his prime. Jeff Lacey was ruined by the Calzaghe fight. Mikhail Kessler in his prime when he fought him and he beat him. I mean, who else can you say could compare as the greatest super middleweight of all time? There's only probably one other fighter of recent memory that you could argue could be up there. And that's probably Andre Ward. Andre Ward's probably yeah. the only other fighter you could argue would be the, the the greatest super middleweight of all time. Interesting question, interesting topic. I'm pretty sure a lot of you listeners will, will probably have your own thoughts about who the greatest super middleweight of all time is. And maybe that's an episode for us to do in the future. But let's just move back into the post-fight and talk about what these guys said in the aftermath of this victory for Calzaghe. And he said, I knew this was going to be one of the toughest fights of my life. Mikel Kessler is a fantastic fighter in his prime. Not bad for a 35-year-old. I'm so proud of my achievements and that of my dad. Victory is so sweet. And he then went on to add, I've always said that I never avoided anybody. Given the opportunity to fight the best, I will show them what I am about. You saw what I could do with Lacey and you've just seen what I could do with Mikhail Kessler. A disappointed Kessler admitted, it wasn't a great performance. He had to be sharp to beat me today and Joe is a spoiler and he spoiled my boxing. Big respect to Joe. Kessler said that it wasn't Calzaghe's punching power that made the difference, but an accumulation of shots. And he said, I don't think his power is really, really hard, but it confuses you when he hits you about 20 times. When he was asked about what he planned to do next at this point, he replied, I haven't thought about it. He's just crushed my dreams. Oh, mate, absolutely devastating for Kessler. And, and you know, you can find uh, of the, the last stories. Uh, that is definitely something we'll point in that direction. The reason why I mention that is because he... He says in that just how Kawasaki switched it up. Kawasaki, he had it. He felt like he had it. He was comfortable for four rounds. I had him three to one up. And then Kawasaki, he, he adjusted. He adapted like true champions do. The best in the world are able to do it. You think of anyone, all the top names, 
they're in a little bit of trouble and they could just make a little tweak in their adjustment and it and it changes the complexion of the fight. And that's what Joe Calzaghe did. And that's what makes him that much better. That's what makes him world class. Whereas, and Kessler was, he said, I was just baffled. I couldn't find a way. He just couldn't f- seem to land a shot and he just wasn't there when he threw the punches. And I think that's just makes it so special. But again, uh, going back to this, uh, the, the final punch, punch stats are HBO indicate that the uh, Welshman threw... 1,010 punches and landed 285 and Kessler threw 585 and landed 173. Uh, that was a 28% accuracy for Calzaghe and 30% for the Dane. I'll do some of these final words. So, so the final words from the HBO team, Emmanuel Stewart, he said, I've never seen him, as in Calzaghe, punch this good. That was the perfect performance tonight. And it's one of those stellar performances that he may never pass. And especially being Kessler, who was very, very focused and determined fighter. And, and Emmanuel Stewart actually did t- say to Steve Bunce, if I remember this correctly, he said that Kessler was good, was brilliant. But uh, Kawasaki was just outstanding. That was just the general consensus this night. Kessler was a very good fighter and very good on the night. It's just Kawasaki was just that little bit better. Max Kellerman, he said... Kalzaghi's performance tonight was not perfect. It was beyond that. He was faced with a prime, young, willful opponent in Kessler, a guy at the top of his game, and Kalzaghi somehow found an extra dimension. And that is why he is now in the conversation for the best pound-for-pound fighter in the world, along with Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather Jr. He then added, What a year of boxing so far. Pavlik Taylor, Kalzaghi Kessler... Next week, we're doing Cotto Mosley. And at the end of the year, Hatton Mayweather. It's a good time to be a boxing fan. Jim Lampley said, The official attendance was indeed 50,150 fans. This was perhaps the most eagerly anticipated fight in the sport between two Europeans. It totally lived up to expectations. The winner was a guy who has long ago proven that he is a worthy world champion. Now unquestionably, he can be seen as one of the greats, Joe Calzaghe. Financially, the fight actually didn't do too great in the States, despite the early morning UK start time. It actually only attracted 1.591 million live viewers, which was at the time the lowest ratings ever for a prime time telecast of HBO World Championship Boxing. And I think it's quite interesting that, because you think about these two guys were the two best best super middleweights in the world. And I think a lot of it was down to the fact that there wasn't a lot of hype for them in America because they'd not really fought in America too much. You know, I think what Kazagi had he previously fought over there once and Kessler, I know, had fought over there before yeah. and they'd not had that exposure, I think, worldwide that they needed to be able to, to sell it to the, the general public in America. Obviously, the UK, it was always going to be a big sellout because of the fact that, you know, this was a British boxer. Yes, he was from Wales. But, you know, when we support our own from whatever part of the UK it's from, we support them. We want to see him do well. So we all supported him that night. And I suppose Denmark, the Danes, you know, they were very supportive of him. Always have been, always will be. But in the US, it just didn't do so well. And I was very surprised to find that out. And looking into the research for the the stats and how it did financially and on the pay-per-view buys in the USA, they just didn't seem to buy into it. And ironically, this was the fight that really got the US fans really interested in Calzaghe. And then you think about what he had left in the aftermath of his career, which we'll go into. It just it just beggars belief how he wasn't given the, the same level of, of support by the US fans. The same with Kessler as well. I know. It is really interesting, isn't it? How, uh, how, that, how that did sort of pan out for him. They really plugged it. I mean, that's why we sort of stuck in Jim Lampley, uh, Sam Kellerman and Emmanuel Stewart and what they said before and after the fight because, you know, they understood the magnitude of the fight and, you know, they made it sound so... I mean, it was. It was a big, big deal. And the fact that, you know, Joe Calzegui had 35,000 uh, come out for him and watch him fight Manfredo and then he ends up getting 55,000 to fight Kessler just shows you, that, like you say, Sean, exactly that, that the British fans, you know, once we get behind our fighters, you know, we come in our numbers. And we don't mess about. <laughs> uh, you know you're going to get that money back some way or another. But with America, it's just slightly different. You know, it obviously didn't captivate him enough. But the, the one thing, again, uh, going back to um, the live stories with, with Kessa, uh, the one thing he said um, after sort of after the fight, which I thought you know, which we had to put in, was that after 
Yeah, all of it had been done. They had done all their interviews and they've all gone back to the dressing room. Mikel Kessa actually remembers uh, sort of dragging Joe Calzaghi and taking him uh, to one side. And this is what he said. He said, I took him into a room and I said, Joe, we have to have a rematch. And <laughs> Calzaghi laughed and he responded. He said, Kessler, it was my night tonight and not anymore. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> they, they did remain friends. Kessa did, did go to his next two fights um, and, and they had a, a little friendship going on and they still do today, which is which is, always happens, isn't it? When you have these kind of fights where not really much trash talking and then they have a, have a, have a bit of a great fight in the ring and then uh, afterwards they just sort of stay buddies forever. It's, it's a great story in just that version of events. I love that. I love hearing that. So for the aftermath for Joe Calzaghe, as we know, later in the year, he was awarded the BBC Sports Personality of the Year for his achievements in boxing in 2007. And he travelled over to the States and fought both Bernard Hopkins and Roy Jones Jr. at the light heavyweight division, winning both by split decision and unanimous decision, respectively. Two of the names he wanted, he finally got them. People said both of these fighters were over the hill. Hopkins went on to beat Kelly Pavlik after he lost to Joe Calzaghe, which made that victory over Hopkins even sweeter. Roy Jones Jr., yeah, he probably was past his prime at this point, but still carried on for years, as we know. But for Cal Zaghi, these two final fights in America that he wanted, he got. And he then retired from the sport with a record of 46 wins, zero defeats, and 32 by way of knockouts. Cal Zaghi defeated 21 opponents, 10 by KO in the world super middleweight title fights between the 11th of October 1997 and 26th of September 2008. He has a record of 10-0 with two KOs against former, current and future world champions. He defeated Chris Eubank, Robin Reed, Richie Woodall, Charles Brewer, Byron Mitchell, Jeff Lacey, Saki Obika, Mikel Kessler, Bernard Hopkins and Roy Jones Jr. And that is a, a, an unbelievable resume. And I think impressive, if, you want, if you want to go into more detail about Joe Calzaghe's life and times in his career we did do a career profile on joe calzaghi one of our early ones that we did so please do go and check that out if you want to hear more about that but johnston if you want to finalize this this tale off by giving people what happened for mikhail kessler in the aftermath of this fight yes yeah, so we've got i'll start just we've got a little bit of kessler because you know we haven't done him before so you know after the fight kessler he had a uh, bad split with his promoter as well um he didn't go into too much detail about it, but it was a it was a bad split, and they went their separate ways. But Calzaghe, well, he vacated the WBA title to move up to the light heavyweight division, and she said to fight Hopkins and Jones Jr. and Kessa actually fought Dimitri Sartizan on the twenty first of June two thousand and eight for the vacant belt, and Kessa knocked out Sartizan in the final round to regain his title and became a two time world champion in the super middleweight division. Great stuff. He successfully defended his title against Danilo Husla. Uh, by a third round knockout and against German Guzmin Perdomo in the, in the fourth round, knocked him out. So in November 2000, the WBA once again promoted him to the super champion. This is where these super regular titles and God knows what other titles they created. This was one of them back then. This is where it all began, I think, more or less. Uh, he then entered the Super Six World Boxing Tournament and he lost. He lost again to Andre Wall by unanimous uh, technical decision in California after getting cut from an accidental clash of heads. And uh, as we said earlier, Andre Wall definitely one of the other super middleweights that you could argue the greatest ever. But Wall, well, this is what he said about Kessler. He said, I don't know if he's the best skill wise, but I think he's the toughest I've ever fought so far. He's proven that. If he loses a title, he can come back and become champion again. He's a great fighter, and I give him a lot of credit, and I have a lot of respect for him. And Kessler and his longtime trainer, who was uh, Richard Olsen, who, or Rickard Olsen, who, who we mentioned at the top of the show, well, they split as well after that walled fight. I think there was a dis disagreement with how that fight went. And he brought in uh, Jimmy Montoya as his head coach. Now, after suffering his second career loss, Kessler returned to Denmark to take on Carl Froch for the WBC Super Middleweight title. Another brilliant fight. He became the three-time world champion, handing Froch his first professional defeat. He then withdrew from the Super 6 World Boxing Classic due to an eye injury and was stripped of the title and was designated by the WBC as champion emeritus. He fought three more times in Denmark. He won the vacant WBO European Super Middleweight title against the Frenchman Mehdi Boudida 
and then the vacant WBC Silver Light Heavyweight title from the American Alan Green, both by knockout and both at the Parkin Stadium. In his last fight in front of his Denmark faithful, he stopped the Brit, Brian McGee, in the third round and picked up the WBA regular super middleweight title and became a three-time world champion. Kessler's last professional fight was at the O2 in London for a rematch against the IBF super middleweight champion Cal Froch. It was another outstanding fight, of course, as we know. Kessler lost by a unanimous decision and his WBA regular title, missing out on becoming a unified champion for a second time. And that was his final fight, and he finished his professional boxing career with a record of 46 wins, 3 defeats, and 35 wins by way of knockout. And I think if you want to go back and look at his career, I mean, correct, again, like you said, correct as if we're wrong, but I don't think he was ever, ever knocked down in his whole career. I think he was hurt a couple of occasions, but I don't think he was ever knocked down. So there you go, it just shows the granite, the granite will and iron heart of a, of a man. And Kessler, if you've got to look at his record in, in world title bouts and championship bouts, he has a record of 10-3 and three with 7 by way of knockout and 9-3 and three against current or former world titleist. He won against Dingan Fubella, Julio Cesar Green, Manny Sica, Anthony Mundine, Eric Lucas, Marcus Bayer, Dimitri Sartizan, Cal Froch and Brian McGee. And the only losses on his career record, of course, against Joe Calzaghe, Andre Ward, and Cal Froch. And I mean, if you look at them three names that he lost to, arguably, in a lot of people's eyes, they are some of the greatest, if not the greatest super middleweights in the past 20, what, 25, 26 years, of course. He, probably since the, the weight class began, really. I mean, you look at the other guys in the division. Nigel Benn, of course, was there at the time in the 90s. Chris Eubank. People talk about who the best in the super middleweight division is. For me, probably Joe Calzaghe. Andre Ward comes a close second. Cal Froch, for me, probably comes a close third. And then you've got to look at the other guys. You know, the guys like Mikhail Kessler, you know, probably comes up there, you know, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a fourth position because of what he did in his career there. So, all in all, Kessler had a brilliant... Kessler had a brilliant career. Cal Zage had a brilliant career. This fight was two of the best super middleweights at that time, giving us one of the greatest fights in boxing history. And I really, really thoroughly enjoy covering it. And I've really... In, enjoyed covering this tale between these two and whilst there wasn't a lot of major storylines major plot lines that go with this particular story there was a tale of of two guys that were at certain points of the career you know you look at Calzaghe and you think of did he really really want to fight Kessler well you know you go back through the story and really he wanted to fight Jones Jr and Bernard Hopkins but it wasn't going to shy away from a challenge against this this guy who had two belts and it was a chance for Joe to unify a division to a degree and that's exactly what he did in this fight and for for us as fight fans it probably brought Kessler into the limelight because we'd never really seen him before other than what we was presented to at the time unless he was an absolute hardcore who was able to scour the boxing forums you wouldn't really necessarily know about Mikhail Kessler at this point and when you've seen the highlights of him the clips of him you're thinking how's Joe Calzaghe going to stand up against this guy you know the 35 year old with brittle hands How's he going to do it? But yeah, he did it. And he did it in, in great fashion. And it was one of the great fights and defining fights of Joe Calzaghe's career. And one of the best fights in the super middleweight division. Oh, mate, I can't agree with you more. That That is definitely one of the best fights in the super middleweight division. And they're throwing up a few. I mean, that's, this is, <laughs> there's been a hell of a lot of those, um, you know, in terms of on our shores. And, you know, just going back to, is Joe Calzaghe the best super middleweight that's ever lived? And, you know, it's a short history. Um, and I do think, I honestly believe it. I mean, people will say a, a peak Roy Jones Jr. who had a brief stint, really, at super middleweight, you know, at his peak would have beaten Joe Calzaghe. But a Joe Calzaghe at his peak gets Roy Jones Jr., uh, it would have been, it, it's a really tough one to call. And then you throw Andre Ward in the mix. You know, them three were, have really just just showed everybody what how great it is. I mean, Andre Ward didn't even get defeated as well. He's another one, another super yeah. middleweight that, that never lost a single fight in his career, like Joe Calzaghe. So it's really interesting. But then, you know, you've got James Tony again, had a brief stint. Steve Collins, Chris Eubank, Nigel Benn, Cole Frutch, Kessler, Michael Nunn was another one. Um, but yeah, these guys, um, to just, you know, <laughs> Calzaghe, Kessler, easily finishing the top 10 as the best ever in this division. And they produced an epic night. And Cole Frutch, you, you chuck Cole Frutch in there with the Kessler fights, the two he has with him, great fights. I was, had the privilege to go and see the second one. Um, but, you know, Joe, uh, for me, uh, 
the more and more, I always, we've done a top 10, uh, top, is it a top 10, top 20, or I think it was top 10 greatest ever British fighters. And Karazogi obviously finished high on the list. But um, the more and more you go into his career and you look at the names he's defeated, um, you can't help but just think that he is quite possibly one of our best ever that's ever been produced. Um, you know, we didn't live in certain times when, when these other fighters like Jimmy Wilder were around. But um, honestly, uh, what a star he was. And, and just watching that fight back, it just made me realise how he was able to adapt against Kessler, a younger guy. How many 35-year-olds could go in a ring, fight a 28-year-old in his peak and adjust the way he did? Uh, not many. And um, impressive performance from Joe. A great legendary night. It really has been. And that old school legendary night, Sean, the one that we used to, the ones we used to do back in the day, you know, our very first, how it all started. We used to just pick our best fight, the relevant of the story behind it. And uh, this just fits that bill. So Dan Loosley, uh, just want to say thank you very much for commissioning it. It's been fun to go back and watch it. Um, yeah, thanks again and, and keep supporting us. Yeah, Dan, thanks so much as always. One of the patrons of the podcast, loyal supporter. He chose this episode for you guys to listen to. We've got one more episode left of Legendary Night Season 2. That'll be coming out in the next three to four weeks. Once that is done and dusted, we'll be back onto the darker side of boxing season two. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please go and check us out on social media at Legend Night Pod or BTR Boxing Pod across all social media platforms. If you've not already subscribed to the YouTube channel, please come and check us out, BTR Boxing Podcast Network. And if you've not become a patron yet and you are interested in becoming a patron, want to check out all the episodes that are unreleased to the public and hear some of the great tales and the great stories of, of different top tens and the Black Murder is Raw and the best boxing movies, then please go and check out the Patreon membership service by putting your hand in your pocket and putting a small fee aside, you'll be able to provide this the additional support that we need to continue pushing this brand forward and getting more brilliant content out to you guys. Patreon.com forward slash BTR Boxing Podcast is the place to go to check that out. But for everybody else, of course, who's always listening and always supporting us and always commenting, we really appreciate you guys too. Thanks for leaving us reviews. Thanks for leaving us ratings on Apple Podcasts. That's really appreciated. Thanks for all the comments, the retweets, the likes, the shares. Everything is truly, truly appreciated. And we hope you've enjoyed this episode, the tale of Joe Calzaghe and Mikhail Kessler. <laughs>